All right, we're now live on Facebook, just FYI. Thank you, Michael, much appreciated. What's uh, that room? Huh? That room. In that, that room now. Arc sheet. <laughs> Conference room. A tape in there. Oh, okay. Was. Registered. Office. <laughs> Guess we got it back. Okay, well, I'm showing um, 12 noon on the dot. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'll call the this so DDA uh, work session to order. Um, as is standard practice, questions will not be taken by members of the public. Um, it's good to see uh, my colleagues, Mr. Laybourne and Mr. Royball in council chambers. Um, I know that staff has gone has worked really hard over the last few days to, to get uh, council chambers ready um, to host the next council meeting on Monday night, uh, making sure that uh, the technology is all in place. So I'd like to thank everybody that's been working on that. Um, and I would just ask uh, both staff and members of the public who may be on today's work session to uh, perhaps exhibit a little bit more patience than normal. If, if, uh, if there is a kind of a glitch, uh, we'll certainly work to get that corrected. Um, and I believe we have Haley Chencher from DDA who will be presenting to us. And Haley, uh, kind of what I've been doing as we've gone along is ask the presenter uh, what their preference is. Uh, would you like to take questions as you go? Or would you like to uh, get through your presentation and then um, take questions afterwards? Hi, um, Councilman. I, I'm happy to wait until the end. I have a lot of fun packed into this presentation. So <laughs> it might be best to fully enjoy it and then we can round it out with, with questions and even more fun. So. I'm I'm sure you do have a lot of fun, and I see that uh, Joe is uh, is uh, supporting you on this uh, thing as well. So no pressure. No pressure. Well, he is my biggest critic, so this will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, we we do miss him. He he was uh, great when he worked with us. So uh, uh, go ahead and uh, get started. Welcome. Um, Thanks guys so much for having us here. My name is Haley Chenchar and I am the assistant director of the Downtown Development Authority. And I also have Amber Ash, who is our executive director for the DDA. Um, as well, virtually, we should have Bruce Perryman, who is the senior partner for AVI, who is an integral part of the report that I'll be talking about a lot today in uh, the presentation. So what we have before you today is for the six penny proposal of a street and alley enhancement project. So. 
just a quick alley map of where we're going in this presentation. I'll start with the intro and the general project overview, which um, was done back in 2017, as well as a, a business SWOT analysis. And um, we'll go into our investment ask, uh, the bottom line and, or I'm sorry, the case study of why that's important, um, project investment and our bottom line. And then the street enhancement proposal, um, just as a, a final item of consideration, and then the community impact that that has, as well as the questions for the end. So let's get started. A brief history of how this came about. Um, so back in 2017, they, the big four uh, economic leaders, which you have the DDA, uh, Chamber of Commerce, Cheyenne Leeds, and Visit Cheyenne, all kind of got together and developed this idea of the downtown alley enhancement uh, study. And so the Laramie County Economic Development Joint Powers Board agreed to fund this study and actually used um, fifth penny funds, about $20,000 to bring this, this study to fruition, which was done through ABI insur um, Engineering, which again, Bruce Perryman really spearheaded all of the yeah, work on that. And so that ran from 2016 and ended in about 2017. And after they concluded the, the report and the research, the project was basically shelved immediately. And that was due to a few different um, reasons. And, you know, it wasn't really the right time. And there was a big lack of funding. And while it was initially on that 2016 six penny, um, it it just didn't have the, the research because the report was being done at the time. So it, it just wasn't ready to uh, really be brought to the public on that. And then just a really uncertain uh, business development and landscape. And it was before we had all that momentum that we've seen in recent years. And there was also a, a real uh, lack and decrease in the leadership. Um, there was some tumultuous uh, organizational decrease in the DDA, the, the executive executive director at the time had just stepped down. And so there wasn't any really clear vision of who would spearhead this project because it's it's really big and you would want to do it right. Um, the project overview, just a quick reminder for those of you who weren't here in 2017, this project is a three-part alleyway that is sandwiched in between 17th and Lincoln Way there, and it spans from Perry to Warren. So the key players back for in 2017, um, they had a committee of, again, those top four, in addition to the city officials, as well as representation from Black Hills Energy, who also happened to be on the Main Street Board as well. Um, I think that was a really strong committee that they had at the time. Again, <clears throat> lots of change in leadership. But if we were to have the six penny, I'd have a proposed committee of, you know, again, those top four, as well as city representatives, um, chosen by government body or, or strategic um, determinations. And then I would also propose additional um, representation from CenturyLink, who is a big part of this report and um, proposal and Black Hills Energy as well. In addition to um, other outside organizations that could be really strategic in uh, community collaboration, whether it's Art Cheyenne or um, other community stakeholders that could really champion this project to um, The objective that was outlined in this 2017 report was um, it provided infrastructure improvements and functionality to an ex improve the overall experience of the downtown core by providing modernized utilities, um, long-term cost savings for everyone involved, um, increased safety and visibility of the alleyways, um, improved walkability and overall downtown connection, and just the continued development of that community fabric that we're really starting to as we, we get into um, 2021 here. Before I get into this, I just want to note, I made these, these graphics as horrible as possible. So you're allowed to laugh at my really bad um, art on this. It's bad Photoshop. You're allowed to laugh. Anyways. Nobody's so, going to laugh. You can so. laugh. You're allowed. So um, utilities. This project at its core and the most important part of it, it's an infrastructure improvement project. And so 
through coordination with Black Hills and CenturyLink, they determined that CenturyLink had the ability to upgrade the existing copper wiring that was um, installed several decades ago to the new fiber optic cable that's all the rage, all the cool kids have it, and um, it would be the opportunity for us to have it too and to become just a bit more cool, as well as Black Hills finding the feasibility of moving our existing overhead electrical structures and actually moving them underground as uh, an underground hidden electrical system, which is very modern, very cool, and very effective. I bet you're wondering what the benefits of that is. And don't worry, I will tell you. So the general project execution of these utilities is that it's, it's a much needed upgrade to our, our existing utilities that we have downtown. And um, I've heard a lot of people, you know, whether it's business owners or just people that I talk to in my day to day, they say, we love the space, but it's ghetto. And so this is an opportunity to make it just a bit less ghetto and bring those utilities up into the 21st century. Um, we also have shared project costs because this is the potential to have three different projects in one. So instead of having to demolish those alleyways one time for fiber connectivity installation, one time for moving that electrical system to the underground, and then one time for a beautification effort, it's done all at once. And there's a big, big cost savings there. Um, and then it just also enhances those resources for, you know, our efforts in business development, attraction and retention. Um, I know that when businesses are looking to relocate, whether it's locally here in Cheyenne to downtown or outside organizations, a big thing that they look for is, is internet and the access to be able to work and not reduce productivity because a lot of our current internet or our current businesses use the internet all the time, day to day. So um, those are the general benefits. As far as the fiber connectivity goes, um, it enhances the, the overall cybersecurity. So, with the, with the original wiring, it's really easy to tap into and hack systems, but with the new fiber connectivity, the only way that people can do it is physically cutting the fiber cables. So it eliminates that on the forefront. It gives easy cloud access, which believe it or not, 90% of organizations and businesses actually use the cloud in some capacity or another, whether or not they know it, it's, it's there and um, everyone has it. So. It also um, increases the reliability, which is a direct relation to business costs. And research indicates that slow internet connections cost employees an average of one week per year of productivity time. So time is money. That's always important. And then um, just some added property value, because who doesn't want good internet? It's like one of my favorite things. So benefits of Black Hills moving that electric facility to the underground is that it increases that reliability. I know that we're all no strangers to power outages um, with the great Wyoming weather that we have. So it would just completely eliminate that because it's now underground and you don't have to worry about it. It enhances the public safety and eliminates um, wires falling and killing innocent bystanders, which is a really big deal. It also lowers those maintenance costs and it minimizes the impact to the visual environment by just moving all of the, the above stuff to the underground. So you can look at the sky and feel like you're right in the country. So the drainage is another part of this report that was done and the proposed pod project actually capitalizes on our existing drainage structure that was installed in the late eighties. And it has slotted drains and drainage patterns and the only proposed change would be an inverted cross crown sec, a crown cross section that just directs water even more efficiently. And um, this is a, a design that was brought forward that it was about 50 to $100,000 of an investment per alleyway when they did this in the 80s. So it's a big cost savings not to go have to go back to the drawing board. It's pretty efficient in drainage as it stands. And so we're, we're fortunate to be able to continue to utilize that, that design and structure. Um, benefits of drainage. It decreases um, the surface water that's on our existing alleyways, which less surface water, it, it extends the alley material lifespan. So I know you all know about concrete when you get water in concrete and it freezes and then it thaws and then 
freezes and it actually cracks all of those materials. So the less surface water, the, the better the lifespan and the longer the lifespan of the materials that we have to pay for. Um, it also enhances safety and walkability. So our um, pedestrians and community members aren't slipping on ice because I've been there and I know everyone else has. And it reduces the pollution from the runoff. And in turn, it just um, keeps you know, the environment up and, and going and less uh, the water that is used is just less polluted. So waste me. Let's talk about some dumpsters, guys. So the proposed services um, with this project, it actually eliminates those freestanding dumpsters. If you see on the, the left photo here, it's a horrible, sad photo, but there's an opportunity to be happy and everyone would love it and enjoy it. And so by eliminating those freestanding dumpsters, it, it, um, it's a centralized location, which is beneficial for everyone involved. And while that does require an agreement among both property and business owners, it is a great reward, whether it's from cost sharing or elimination of those odors and eyesores that I'll, I'll talk about in just a moment. And you get that great photo on the right, possibly, potentially. So the benefits of this. Um, centralizing that pickup location of the trash services, it means less pickups um, for city workers, which means less resources and time that our city personnel can be doing and using for other things. Um, it's incredibly valuable. And in turn, that also cuts down on the risk of potential workers' compensation claims, as well as overtime costs that the city currently would have to pay out because of those multiple pickups. Um, it also improves that surface water removal. Again, less clutter on the alleys reduces the surface water. And um, we're big fans of drainage. We just touched on it. It also enhances the public safety perception by eliminating those, those hiding places for transients and um, the homeless as they, as they travel through town. And I know that I've snuck up unintentionally more than once on, on people behind dumpsters who are just kind of sitting and resting. And so, especially at night when you're a woman, that's, that's a little alarming. So it, it really enhances that, that sense of safety that I know we're all striving for for downtown Cheyenne. Um, it eliminates unwanted odor and eyesores unless you've had COVID and can't smell. Um, those smells are, they're pretty uh, serious <laughs> and they'll knock you down as, and so having that in a, a closed off location just really eliminates that, um, that aspect. And then it decreases the grease traps and pollution. You can see in the photo, um, what I've crossed off, that's grease. And, um, that is a real fire hazard and it's just a real pollution hazard as well that drains into our waterways and it's just, um, bad all around. So really centralizing that eliminates a lot of those, those hazards. And then again, the shared costs of waste management services, instead of every single business owner, property owner having to pay their own individual, um, trash pickup, it's, it's shared cost. And so it, it's uh, lower expenses for those involved. Site enhancements, now it's the fun stuff. Um, in this report, the proposed site enhancements included entrance bowl bounce with street tree planting beds, which I bet you don't know what that is. I didn't either. It's extension of sidewalks. So it, it really enhances that, that streetscape and it extends the alley in itself to kind of spill out onto the the connecting streets there. It also um, proposes seat walls that matches the, the depot plaza walls and it's a really consistent design um, that capitalizes on the investment the city has already made in downtown. Irrigated planting areas, decorative pedestrian lights with hanging baskets, um, installation of brick pavers, which is really helpful when you are trying to go uh, do a maintenance on that underground electrical system because instead of having to tear out an entire concrete pad, you just have to remove those individual brick pavers. Um, decorative uh, string tivoli lighting, fine trellis greenery, and there's a lot of opportunity areas for mural space, which is exciting and, and it continues to increase that, that art environment that we have going up. And the benefits of all of these enhancements, um, like I had said, it ex 
those bulb outs extend alley environment into streetscapes and, and spills that and creates a better connection as you go from those three chunks of alley onto the street. Um, this design enhances the city's existing investment in the aesthetic and the, the vibe that they have going on downtown with that reddish brick and um, just continues on that. The planting areas and the vine trellis, it offers opportunities for sustainable community placemaking. If I had a dollar for every time I had a community member say, we should have a garden in our planters, I could probably fund the planter project. But unfortunately, that's not the best use of them. I wish it was, but this is a great opportunity to do something like that. Um, as well, it creates a unique pedestrian experience. We aren't Fort Collins. We're much cooler, but it is a similar vibe. And then it's an opportunity to feature local talent and collaborate with outside organizations. So you think about those vine trellises, um, you could do vertical gardening, which Bright Agrotech over in Laramie has done a fantastic job in developing their products that does just that, local Wyoming business. And then that opportunity to collaborate with Art Cheyenne or the Paint Slingers event that happens every year um, to highlight and feature that local talent for mural, which also cuts down on the, the costs that we would initially have to invest for those mural spaces in this project. All right, getting into the SWOT analysis. If you didn't go to business school, I don't blame you, but this is something I learned in college. And it's, a, it's actually a pretty efficient tool in how to develop project strategy and provides a full picture, the good, the bad, and the ugly of a proposal. So. SWOT, the first one is uh, project strengths. Um, at its core, again, this is the modernization of existing infrastructure. It improves that utility access and it brings us into the 21st century. Um, it also utilizes our existing drainage structure, which is a big cost savings and not having to go back to the drawing board, as I'd mentioned. It consolidates that waste management services, which cuts down on cost and eliminates a lot of those odors and eyesores that we are currently experiencing. It enhances our sense of safety in a, as a downtown, and that's something we're always striving for. It's also a beautification effort that capitalizes on our, the city's um, established investment in the, the current aesthetic and vibe of downtown. It improves the walkability, which is um, good because I know that people always say there's no parking in downtown. And while I don't agree, this just gives you more opportunity to walk around, get those steps in. And as well, it aids in preparing existing sites for business development. So you think about things like the Heinz building and the Pole and things like that. It's those sorts of projects are incredibly large to take on, but having access to these modern resources and utilities is a is one step closer to this effectively developing these spaces for long term. Um, the weaknesses of this project. I would say there's not any, but we gotta be realistic here. There is a potential uh, gray area in the city code. And I've been talking with Bruce um, about what specifically that is. It would just need some clarification. There's a city code 13.04.120, um, which basically resolves around um, hookups and the business owner's responsibility to have to pay for that. So it would just be, um, a clarification to ensure that downtown business community doesn't have to pay for anything unexpected with this project. And that's a, a pretty easy workaround. But the second weakness is the estimated construction phasing time. I We have two seasons in Wyoming, it's winter and then construction season. And so we all know how long that takes. And so it's just an, something to plan for because it is a pretty lengthy amount of time. And then the third, uh, the time investment to coordinate with those impacted business and property owners. Um, while this is a lot of effort on um, the DDA's end and, and the uh, alleyway committee, the payoff of this and that open line of communication far exceeds the initial time investment that it does take to um, connect with all of the people affected. The opportunities of this project, um, we have a lot of long-term benefits um, for both existing and potential businesses, whether it's cost sharing and just better utilities and increased foot traffic. Um, it, there's just a lot that everyone can benefit from. Again, that three projects in one, um, only having to pay those demolition costs one time instead of three times. The potential to highlight local talent and collaborate with outside organizations. Um, 
we have a lot of really great Wyoming talent here. And I know that we've been getting better about featuring this and, and really highlighting it for our local community, but this is a great opportunity to continue using that. It creates those accesses to key resources that are essential for um, outside business attraction and long-term business attraction. And it creates a possibility to contribute to the increasing downtown revitalization, revitalization momentum. So the city has already done a lot of projects. You know, you think about the Depot Plaza and how successful that's been. Civic Commons um, is beautiful and, and has so much potential and they did a great job with that. And then just connecting with 17th Street and even the West Edge development and all the plans that we have there. We've seen a lot of, of momentum happening over the past few years. And this is a really good time to be able to continue on that and just build that community fabric. The project threats of this, um, if we continue to wait, um, the yearly project cost increase is alarmingly high. It's a 4% increase per year, which that doesn't sound bad, but it's crazy. Um, we'll get to the numbers in a second, but it's increased 16% since this report was done in, in 2016. Um, there's also a missed opportunity to capitalize on existing infill development areas. And so you think about while Cheyenne is developing more outside business parks, if businesses are to relocate to those business parks, well, that's wonderful. It also extends our current services, our city services, whether it's fire and MR and all of those sorts of things and police services. Um, and it's, it's adding additional areas to service. And so having that infill area opportunity is, is essential to save the city on costs because if you have an area that's already being serviced, why not have as many people to service in that, yeah. And then loss of business, if this isn't implemented, you know, um, as things continue to age, we will have businesses that look over, not just the downtown, but Cheyenne completely because they don't have the upgraded utilities and business resources that they need to run a successful business. And we need to be able to compete with those bigger areas who have um, those sorts of resources. Case studies. I have a few different ones. Um, we'll just touch lightly on this. They have had a, a lot of different alley revitalization and enhancement projects around the world. Um, I could go on and on about everything we've learned, but Fort Collins, I know we hate getting compared to Fort Collins, but it's actually internationally known for their alley enhancement efforts and their revitalization. Um, they have a million phases. Every single one of them has been successful and it's been a huge increase in pedestrian traffic for their businesses and um, an increase in their, their customers in general. So they, they are a real shining star to kind of look to as well as um, Los Angeles. They're, they did an alley enhancement project that was more geared towards crime and it actually significantly reduced their crime efforts. And while that's not like our main focus here, it was, is, it was pretty impactful for LA and, and I would imagine it would have, you know, similar effects with our perception of safety here. So our ask for this, um, again, I just wanna hit that this project, it provides invaluable long-term benefits for every single person involved, unlimited project potential of both a return on investment for the city, as well as all organizations. And then it's that three project cost in one, and at least 17 businesses are um, impacted by this and could change for the better. This project includes complete um, construction, demolition, utilities, earthwork, the site lighting and electrical, um, the general site work, site furnishings, landscape, irrigation, as well as the installation of Black Hills Energy and CenturyLink for that total of uh, 3,339,100 million. I bet you're wondering why now? This is really important. And um, the fact of the matter is we can't afford to continue to wait on this. Um, the cost of this project has increased over $250,000 since 2017. I thought that was like last year. It feels like it was last year, but um, that was five years ago. And if we wait another five years, we're gonna be half a million dollars um, in the hole on this. And we've already had a significant investment 
um, whether it's the feasibility study or um, all of the efforts that have been put forth in the time of the, the 2017 key players. But I think this is a really good, we have an opportunity here to capitalize on our leadership and our communication that we have with council and our, um, our governing body, as well as our other clear vision and leadership from the, organ the big four organizations. Um, we have a, a more favorable business development landscape and long-term outlook. Um, Giants popping, it's getting better. And I, I've i been pleasantly surprised with how successful um, we've had with new business openings, especially during COVID. And I see that continuing to grow. And I just think this is a really good time to act on this project. And um, just continuing to build on the momentum that the city has executed and seen as well as um, the rest of our downtown. So the bottom line and project takeaways of this is that this project is an essential downtown infrastructure that modernizes utility access and provides key tools um, for existing and potential businesses that are necessary for daily operations. What this project isn't is a beautification effort, although that is a nice bonus and um, I won't say no to it. We have one final item for your consideration today that it's included in the street and alley enhancement proposal. And um, it's everyone's favorite topic, the 17th street lighting project finalization. So just a quick background on this project. It was proposed in 2006 in a market-based downtown plan. It was then included in the 2012 six penny ballot, um, proposition six. The phase one investment was $700,000 and um, the Nanine block lighting was actually um, funded by a grant and completed in 2012. So from that 700,000, we have a remaining 26,000 of um, the remaining funds. And with that in mind, the investment cost that we would need to finish out this project is 273,000. And that does reflect um, using up that $20,000 in funds. I know this is a touchy subject, but I want to talk about the impact and what I've seen specifically just in my last year as um, a part of the DDA, but the 17th street lights are really quickly um, becoming something that has put Cheyenne, Wyoming on the map. If you see that picture on the far right with the snow, um, that was something that I had shared on the DDA page um, after that big blizzard and it would it effectively went viral. Um, it's reached 2 million people. And there's a reason for that. Every every photo that's taken of the 17th Street lights is um, has some level of vira virality. And that's because it's so striking. And um, there's a big sense of Cheyenne community pride that's associated with the 17th Street lights that um, we need to be able to have that identifying factor that is becoming nationally recognizable to other communities. Um, this is an irreplaceable component of our downtown identity and, and community fabric. And it's just something that everyone in Cheyenne is proud of. And it, it's really impactful for the citizens living here as well as people visiting. And so while we there are some cost-saving efforts to finish and um, finish the project, it really boils down to, we want to have the opportunity to finish this project and spend the money needed to do it right. So we don't jeopardize all of the progress and investment that we've made. So we're including that on the last um, part of this proposal. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you, Haley. That was that presentation was very well done. Um, before I uh, take questions from my colleagues, I had uh, one that kind of popped into my head and I don't know if you could answer it or maybe Bruce from um, ABI, but what you mentioned the cost of increase uh, or in increased cost of the project over the last four years. Is that basically uh, due to supply uh, increases, construction cost increases. Um, is, is that really 
why the projects increased $300,000 over the last four years? Uh, Councilman, the short answer is yes, but if Bruce is on, I'm sure as an engineer, he has a good engineer answer that might be able to work <laughs> yes. better than he me. Is, he is on. Go okay. ahead, Bruce. Uh, Councilman, the uh, update and cost was determined by using the RS means construction standard index. So what it does is it provides you a look back to 2017 versus what 2021 would be. And in, in doing that analysis, it came out there was about a 4% per year increase. Uh, and, and they uh, assembled data from all over the region and produced that, those index factors. And so that's what was used. Uh, one more question, Bruce, before I turn it over to my colleagues. So we've heard um, in other presentations that uh, supply and cost have really increased exponentially over the last year due to the pandemic. So is this cost estimate inclusive of that? Because I, and I know that you all have done your due diligence and I appreciate that, but the one thing I know that none of us want to see, because we've seen it in the past, is that we a, a project makes it to the ballot and it has a, uh, a proposed cost. And then after all is said and done, it winds up uh, that the money we collected on the ballot did not meet uh, the expectation. And so we're left, we're, we're left with, uh, um, money outstanding uh, that didn't get covered from the ballot. So I just kind of wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, Jeff. So uh, some of the more uh, specific items, Black Hills Energy's cost uh, went up more than 16% because their wire and their uh, transformers uh, had larger increases due to COVID related items. I think that applies to CenturyLink as well. They've got a new subcontractor that they use and their prices went up. Uh, Coven's had an impact uh, on materials. Um, people don't inventory as much product anymore. So it's all specially made and you have to sign a work order before they'll even start it in production. That being said, uh, these estimates are good for 2021. When the six penny tax projects get approved, often those projects don't start for a three year lead time. So you would wanna add in that additional factor of inflation that we can't account for today on when this would fall in the sequence of six penny projects if, you know, when it's approved and awarded. Um, it'd be great to see this project happen day one, but any of your six penny projects are gonna see that inflation if they get pushed out to year five, year four. Right. Yep. Understood. Thank you for that explanation, Bruce. <clears throat> Questions from my colleagues? Mr. President. Mr. Roybal. Just a couple, three for eight. Um, on the spill outs in the alleys, will those actually go into the street or will they just encompass them? Councilman, thank you. Um, so those spill outs, it doesn't go into the street. It just continues into the, the existing sidewalk. So um, it won't affect any of the asphalt placement or anything like that. And it's, we sent you the, the updated project report. So you can see the, the diagrams more clearly in there than a PowerPoint presentation, but you can see pretty clearly. So it won't affect the, the roads, fortunately. Then secondly, have we, uh, have you spoken to the owners of the Heinz building? Because we realize some things there because they're going to have to tear up, you know, when they, when they do the reconstruction, um, would there be something there that would realize savings? Mr. Chairman, through you to Councilman Roybal, um, you know, at this point we haven't extensively engaged um, with the Heinz and potential whole partners um, on this particular project. Um, certainly putting in the infrastructure, having Black Hills Energy um, pull the new wiring for, and having that there for future development of the whole, as well as having the um, upgraded fiber um, optics there for future development. Um, you know, every time 
those types of things are put in place. That's just one more small piece of the puzzle. Um, the Heinz in the whole, you know, I know everybody wants a fast and easy solution. It's a very, very complicated um, situation with the Heinz in the whole. Um, and so every time we knock down one more barrier, we're one step closer, um, you know, and, and the, the goal is um, Betsy Hell, who is um, the CEO for, for Leeds, you know, she always talks about uh, development is a marathon, not a sprint, right? Um, and it's like one of my favorite <clears throat> quotes um, because that's what we've seen with the Heinz in the whole is it has really been a marathon. It has gone on a very, very long time. Um, you know, and it's really easy to say the, the private sector should um, be able to develop this. Why can't we get this developed? But every time we have a developer come in, there's somewhere between a three and $6 million gap. Um, and so things like this start taking away from that gap. They start chipping away. Do they fix everything? No. But are we headed in the right direction? Yes, absolutely. And the last question to you, Mr. is on the project investment. Uh, our ask. It uh, have a subtotal of two million and change. Black Hills Energy and Black Hills Energy and Century become five hundred two. Are we looking at them to pay that portion of it, or are we paying them to put it in? Um. Mr. Sherman, through you to Mr. Roybal and Bruce, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, as, as I understand that, um, because these upgrades are, I don't wanna say not required, but technically um, the facilities that exist now function. They, they meet basic needs, correct? Um, so pushing those costs off to the consumers, um, of that isn't necessarily something that Black Hills or, or CenturyLink can do. Um, and so this would be a public investment um, through the six penny. So it would be included in that overall cost. The three million three plus, let's say the 17th Street enhancement is what we'd be putting on to the, uh, the six penny. That's correct. And I think um, Mr. Chairman um, to Mr. Roybal, to kind of address a little bit of um, earlier's conversation, you know, when I was a commissioner, one of the things we did to hedge off some of the um, cost escalation um, was bonding the, the project up front. Um, you know, DDA has bond capacity. Um, that's something that we can look into and look to utilize um, in order to hedge off some of the inflation. Um, because obviously in this case, um, if this was approved by the voters, then we would have the revenue coming in to pay the bond. Um, you know, and, and certainly um, when those revenue collections, one of the things we were very careful about when we set up that for the um, event center was making sure that there was no prepayment penalty. Um, so, you know, as collections came in quicker, we were able to pay it off more quickly. And then of course, um, eventually the commission took the money um, just out of reserves and paid that off completely and then is paying themselves back now um, through the collections. Um, but through that process, and there was additional um, savings on the interest, um, which they were then able to put back into the project. Um, and so, you know, there are some some additional steps and things that we can do to, to hedge off some of that inflation. Are we going to beat it all? No. Are some things unpredictable? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when when we started the event center, for example, nobody anticipated that um, steel prices, that um, the tariff that would go into place, steel prices would skyrocket 30%. Unfortunately, there were some other factors that came in below cost, um, and we were able to work through that on the commission. Um, but certainly, there are just some unanticipated events, things that can happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roybal. All great questions. Other questions? Mr. President, this is Pete Laborn. Mr. Laborn. So um, being very familiar with those alleys, I recognize your uh, picture there behind Sanford's and the uh, disaster it is. Um, 
I'm curious, and I'm looking here at the uh, picture here, the drawing. So who is to care for these landscaped items? Um, Mr. Chairman, through you, um, I would ultimately anticipate that since it's the DDA proposing this project, that becomes the responsibility of the, the DDA to maintain the, the flowers and the trellises and the lights um, as part of this project. You're saying you would you expect the city to maintain them? The no. Parks and I'm saying that the DDA would maintain them because we're the ones proposing the projects. Hey, and do you have any uh, maintenance identified over the long term? Not at this time, no. And I was very curious about the uh, trash and grease <laughs> arrangement. Um, I, think, I, I, I totally agree, and it is really shameful if you want, and dangerous if you understand what's going on there behind San, Stanford's, but what sort of um, process have you proposed for the sanitation department to use in, in this new approach? Councilman, um, so we haven't specifically talked to the sanitation yet, but as I had kind of mentioned, moving that to a centralized area for pickup and then eliminating those freestanding dumpsters is, is a proposed solution to this. Um, I, as far as the details of how that would affect their pickup times and all that, we haven't gotten that far. Does that answer your question or? Well, I, Certainly as a downtown property owner that has several dumpsters, how awkward they are and how uh, another approach might be better, but I'm just wondering about the specifics of, of that and how the sanitation department would coordinate that. I'm actually, uh, well, that's something I'd like to learn more about. So did you earlier, uh, say that you sent us a some sort of further analysis besides what we hear? Yes, Councilman. Um, I had Jennifer McLeland. She sent you an updated report that reflects both 2017 numbers as well as the 2021 cost estimates. That includes all the diagrams and all of the report that was generated back in 2017. So that would hopefully answer your questions as well. Well, I'll look forward to reviewing that. As far as the lighting project, which finishing the lighting project is obvious high expectation. There's twenty six thousand dollars you're talking about. What's the funding mechanism, um, Mr. Chairman? Through you to Councilman Layborn, that funding mechanism is the remaining um, twenty twelve spot tax. Uh, left over. So unless the city has reallocated that from the 17th Street project, there should be about $26,000 remaining there. Well, it was my understanding that the contract with the AVI was not closed out and finished either. Last I knew that was um, correct, that there were still billable hours available on that contract. So, um, very interesting how it fits in with the rest of the alleys in downtown uh, is uh, primary importance. I do want to express my concern for the fact that throughout the downtown, the alleys deteriorated. That slotted drain pipe in any case has needs some serious attention. And I'm wondering, in terms of communication to the property owners and even the people that are interested in town, were there public meetings in the initial proposal? 
um, Mr. Chairman, through you to Councilman Layborn. I wasn't part of this project in 2016, 2017. Um, so would need to defer to Bruce Perryman as part of that. I do know you will see in the feasibility study that was sent to you um, that there was initially um, some newspaper coverage, a copy of the article is actually included in that feasibility study um, that was printed. Um, so I do know that there was some levels of public engagement, but since I wasn't involved in 2016 with this project, I think it'd be best if Bruce responded to that. And so <laughs> at this time, what kind of public outreach are you considering that people know what might be possible? Um, Mr. Chairman, through you to Councilman Layborn. Um, so it'd be very similar to the work I did um, for the 2016 uh, spot tax um, to educate the public um, in terms of, you know, looking for opportunities to publicly present. Opportunities, for example, may include um, things like Kiwanis, the Rotary, the Lions, um, the Cowgirls, all of those types of groups that have luncheons, the realtors, um, things like going to the nursing homes, attending, um, you know, the, the Burns, Pine Bluff, and Allen Town meetings. Um, traditionally, the city and the county have also opened um, or held open houses um, for people to come ask questions. Um, so certainly do some work through that. Um, obviously, you know, since part of our funding is uh, taxpayer funding, um, we cannot lobby, we can only educate um, and would certainly be out there as part of that to have those conversations and make people aware of what the project is and what it will do. Well, thank you. Well, I am thoroughly familiar with the campaign element um, and uh, was on the council when the final choice was made uh, in 17 not to include this project. So I remember a lot of those details. My question was more present time or we proceed with council's analysis. Have you, and I know that it's difficult at this time to have much public participation, but have you done any that, I mean, I assume that your board has decided that this was what they wanted to do taking a vote to that end, um, have you, and am I correct in assuming that the other entities mentioned earlier in this, in your presentation have also so endorsed this concept? Uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to Councilman Layborn. Um, so the um, board is aware of the project. Um, we were really originally looking at uh, for the six penny proposal, the uh, Lincoln Way um, placemaking plan. Um, however, as I continue to work through that as part of the strategic plan, it um, became apparent that that project was not appropriate to move forward. Um, and so one of the things that we did is we went back through um, old studies and had some conversations about what might be appropriate to consider at this time. Um, after evaluating this project and really looking at the case studies, um, some of which were highlighted earlier, um, we felt like this was a very good project to put forth at this time, particularly when you look at some of the work and the enhancements um, in terms of the murals and stuff through the alleyways um, and trying to continue that momentum. Um, I could tell you I park in one of the alleys. There's not a day that goes by that I don't see somebody back in that alley admiring the artwork. Um, continuing to foster that environment, I think is very, very important um, in order to continue to expand and promote our tourism um, to embody a greater segment of the population. Well, it uh, <clears throat> certainly is something that I see elsewhere. And really the alleyways are, could be a safe, well-lit, area for people to cross the community. So uh, 
you certainly have uh, covered these points. I'll look forward to reviewing the further documentation. I probably have some further questions. This is uh, quite a step. Pairs with the, so uh, that, those are my questions, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Laybourne. And, um, you know, I really agree with, with some of the things Mr. Laybourne pointed out. Just a quick comment uh, before I take other questions. Um, five years ago, I, I took a walk with uh, Mr. Laybourne through some of these alleys and uh, yes, walking past some of those grease dumpsters and um, uh, very concerning. One of the other things uh, that I think this project addresses um, and a lot of people may not may not notice it uh, walking through, but uh, Mr. Laybourne pointed it out to me. Some of those wires on these utilities um, that would be underground, uh, those wires are fraying. Um, and if you take the time to kind of look at some of those in these in these three specific alleys, particularly, um, you can notice that those uh, wires are not. Um, they're certainly not new wires. Um, so uh, I think this project would address that problem as well. Are there other questions from colleagues? I know that uh, Mr. Johnson, Dr. Rennie, and uh, Dr. Aldridge are all on. Any questions? Is Michelle going first? Um, Ms. Dr. Aldridge is on uh, an audio line and uh, haven't haven't heard her speak up to ask questions. Go ahead, Richard. I know you have a limited amount of time. Okay, thank you. So I'll try to make this quick. Okay, so in uh, 2017, what we had heard is from John Volk. I am concerned about other stakeholders in the downtown core that show that looked at the first um, proposal as favoritism of why they had to pay money out of their own pockets when it, the taxpayers were being asked to take care of 17th Street part. So that's something I'd like to have addressed uh, with other businesses outside of this corridor. Another concern that came up in 2017 was uh, in regards to businesses that we need to reach out to them, um, not necessarily after the project has been completed, like we discussed with the dumpsters in one central location, but we need to re reach out to those businesses in regards to their out time. A lot of businesses when Laneway was under construction talked about how people could not access their business. So what are they out for their out time? Uh, for things like especially power, because if we're back there working with Black Hills, are they going to be without power? Are they going to be without internet? And then are they going to be without trash pickup? Those are just three concerns off the top of my head during construction on how we're actually going to coordinate with them to get these uh, services rendered during the time of outage. Uh, Haley had brought up Chapter 13. If she could email me which section she was talking about in Chapter 13, since we are currently doing an overhaul and that chapter is supposed to be completely revised uh, coming up in July. So, so we can basically get a jump on that. Uh, if she could send me that chapter so we can make sure that there was no changes uh, coming up in a pending council uh, ordinance change. Um, in regards to uh, what Amber had said, it sounds like they're under the same uh, limitations that we are, that we're not allowed to advocate. Um, we are only allowed to educate. And so if this actually goes under the quality of life for bundling, uh, is there a plan set up for other items that may end up on the uh, proposition that they need to get in touch with those other individuals? Uh, my goal is to see that we can get at least $120 million passed on the budget. So I would hate to see one project uh, get killed that has merit um, in regards to a so I'd like to see a lot more teamwork in regards to all the entities that are involved on each proposition to team up and actually get their projects um, out to the public. Um, he had brought up in regards to who was responsible after. Uh, I always prefer to have everything in writing, even though it's um, under the public record under this meeting. But if a MOU or something to that effect could be set in place uh, to say that uh, the DDA accepts responsibility after the project's completed and the city absolves itself of responsibility because we've seen that in uh, past projects. Um, another, my last concern is 
it's Pioneer Avenue. I'm worried that the fact that the alleyways we're looking at are going to end at Cary. That's what happened with the 17th Street Lighting Project. I can see people concerned that we didn't include that fourth alleyway. I had brought this up in 2016, 2017 in regards to adding additional alleyways um, to put on the ballot so we could get them all done at once. Like they said, cost estimates do go up. And so I would hate to uh, put the 17th Street Lighting Project on the front with the bulbs and then they're left out in regards to the alleyways that we just stopped construction at uh, Cary. So those are my concerns. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Dr. Rennie or Dr. Aldridge? I have no questions, Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Rennie. Dr. Aldridge? Um, it looks like uh, there are no further questions. I will point out to my colleagues, uh, Jen, our, uh, Jennifer did email us, um, I think the studies that uh, Haley was referring to uh, at 11.09 this morning. If you have not checked your email, it should be there. And um, Haley and uh, Amber, thank you again for the presentation today. Uh, President White, Michael Skinner here. If, uh, we're looking on Zoom. It looks like uh, Dr. Aldridge may have a question. Uh, it looks like she's unmuted if she has one at this time. Hi, uh, uh, President. Thank you, uh, Mr. Skinner. President White, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, joining you from the beautiful downtown Shoshone. So, um, just to uh, thank you so much, Haley, for the presentation. A couple of questions that I have. One is, um, what is included in, in the $200,000 plus price tag of finishing the 17th Street project? And my second question is, has, there, has DDA ever been included on a six penny ballot previously? And if so, have those been, successful pro have those been successfully funded? Um, thank you, Dr. Aldridge. Mr. Chairman, through you to Dr. Aldridge. Um, so the 17th Street Lighting Project, the 273,000, um, that includes the contractor bond and insurance, a construction surveying and staking, uh, mobilization, demobilization, the force account, materials, testing, traffic control, um, removal and disposal of the old structures and obstacles, um, base grading, um, removal and replacement of curb and gutter, um, and then removal of the sidewalk um, and replacement with concrete and stamping, and then of course the electrical and street lighting. Um, and then the second question, can you remind me what the second question was? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, I just was second. curious as to whether DDA had ever been had a six penny ballot uh, sales tax um, item before and if it had been successful in being funded. Um, yes, yeah. and the seven street, 17th Street Lighting Project was a DDA project uh, and that was funded. Uh, but okay. Okay. You Thank you. To answer that, Amber. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, so that's the only, I guess, looking historically, I haven't gone back far enough. Um, my understanding was in 2017, this actual project was supposed to be the DDA project. Um, in 2012, as Jeff indicated, the proposed project was 17th Street Lighting. I don't know any further back than that. Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. Laybourne. Well, I think there might be some clarification necessary here. Although the 2012 lighting project was a project that initiated by the, it was managed, constructed by the city. So I think we need to be clear about this. And, and I'm assuming uh, in the case of Alley Project, something similar would occur where uh, DDA brings a project forward, uh, develops concept and design, and then the city takes it and bids it and manages it 
from there. So I just wanted to be clear that the DDA does not manage construction of this magnitude. Right, yes, yes, sir. Uh, duly noted, uh, thank you for that clarification. Um, any other questions? Well, hearing none, uh, thank you again both uh, for a very informative presentation. We, we really appreciate it. And with that, we'll adjourn this work session and we'll be back at it again tomorrow at noon. Thank you.